Well, praise the Lord. Welcome to Cross Time with Pastor Curtis. We're thankful that you're here today, and we're just excited about uh, what we are doing here. We're studying the letter to the uh, church in Ephesus and to the faithful who are in Christ Jesus. That's who the letter was written to, not just a group of people in that day, but to the faithful who are in Christ Jesus, who happens to be us, by the way, because we are faithful in Christ Jesus as we keep our faith in what he did for us to be faithful for us to us at Calvary on that cross, and I'm thankful today. And uh, On this wonderful Friday here in Queen City, Texas, on the 13th day of October, we're in our 49th session, and as I said earlier, we're in the book of Ephesians. I hope you get your Bible, and many of you in our area who are watching right now are watching this at some later date. Uh, I want you to know this is not a crossway church thing. This is a community Bible study. And if you know the message of the cross, you're thankful for the message of the cross, and you live in this community, and I'd say within 30 miles of here, you need to be here on Friday mornings. You can get up out of that bed. You can bring your Bibles if you're not working, you're retired, whatever the case may be, and you can be here, and you can come and have this study in the Word with us and fellowship, and and we'd be glad to see you no matter what church you go to. We're not trying to get you in our church. We're trying to get you in the Word so the Lord can deal with you in the way you need to be dealt with with. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's ask the Lord to bless us this morning as we get into the Word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning to open the bread of life that we might see Jesus. And Lord, I pray for a greater revelation of Jesus as we study the Word of God today, that you would give us the truth that you have hidden not from us but for us. Lord, we do cry out today for truth and and the understanding of your Word, Lord, that we might run this race faster, that we might learn to trust you and love you more and we ask it all in the name of Jesus today and everybody said amen amen right before we dig in all God's works are done in truth that's Psalms 33 4 we're letting you know this book's $15 I promise it'll bring great clarity to the scriptures for you Uh, there's lots of good things in this little book it's full of the word it's not full of opinion it's full of the word of God in truth and it will help you so just uh, send your money to that physical address or just uh, hit the donate button on the website www.thecrosswaychurch.com and we'd be glad to send you this book free of shipping and handling on your part we'll pay for that so Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 is where we will begin today it's where we kind of left off last week and the Bible says and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And, and he starts out by saying, and, it's because he's, he's already told us to do. Let, let's back up and start with verse 12 so we can roll into this this morning. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That lets us know our problem's not with people. Although they may be a problem, they're not, they're not really our problem. They're not the ones we're wrestling with as Christians. He says, but we are wrestling against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And because of that, you're going to have to take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now, and we talked about last week, our, our having done all is not a bunch of things we go do. Our having done all is taking unto us the whole armor of God which means we keep our faith in the cross. That's what that means. That's how we take unto us the whole armor of God, as we'll see when we roll through this study a little further, that each piece of the armor represents Jesus and what he provided only through the cross, his death. And we'll see that as we study this. So he says, Stand therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And we discussed those things last week, and this week we're going to roll right into verse 15. That says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And that's where we'll begin today and we'll break this little verse down. Because, you know, when we read scriptures like, and your feet shod, well, that's really not an American word that you hear every day or you ever hear. And so we have to look these words up and see that the New Testament, knowing it was translated <coughs> excuse me, from the Greek, we look at this, these words in a concordance and we see what words are pulled 
uh, these derived for the meaning from. So I want to break this down to you. And anybody that wants to go look it up, you're going to find the exact same thing. You're not going to find something different. And if, if that were the case, then the Bible couldn't have the clarity it does. It couldn't have bring the assurance it does. If you could l go look it up and it mean one thing and I look it up and it means something different and they both meant something opposite, then that wouldn't be the Word of God. The Word of God uh, can be dug into and studied and the words that you find that, that these words in the Bible also mean are always going to mean the same thing with just in depth. More in depth. The, some of these Bibles that are out there, these versions that change what the Bible has said all the years and years we've had the Word of God, they're not accurate. Throw them in the trash, get rid of them, don't even give them to nobody else. When you look these words up in the Word of God in these concordances, uh, you're going to find just a more in depth. That's why you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and people ask me all the time, why do we have to have four Gospels? Aren't they the same thing? And some of them even sound like they're saying something different, preacher. Well, the reason, man, if you were on one side of a car accident and I was on the other side of the road, it'd be the same accident. You just saw it from that side. I saw it from this side. Same accident. That's what the Gospels are. That's what uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus had his disciples walking with them. They saw everything he did, but they saw it from different views points. It's the same story, same Jesus. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. That's just a simple part of, of uh, ignorance on our part of not studying like we should. I promise you, if you study the Word of God like God told you to do so that you could be a, a ready workman, uh, un, you know, prepared for all the works God's called you to do, you'll find there are no contradictions in the Word of God. That it is right on and it never has contradiction. It's always right. So these words like shod, when you look it up, it means to bind under one's feet. To have our feet shod means we've got something bound to our feet. I mean, this is what we're walking in. This is what we're walking in. We're, our feet are shod. And, and what he tells us that what's bound under our feet, he says, is the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the word preparation really just means a, a readiness. You know, if you're getting ready to paint a room, what's the first thing you got to do? Prepare it. That's always, almost always the toughest, t most time-consuming part is preparing for a job. The setup, the scaffolds, the mud boards, or the taping, and the sanding, and all the stuff that happens before. And so we got to be ready. That means we've got to sh sh have shod to our feet. That means bound to our feet, determined to be ready to share the gospel of peace. And so that's what these words mean, to bind under one's feet. That means that's where we get the word uh, shod, to bind under our feet. Preparation means to be ready. In the faith, our walk is bound with a readiness to share the gospel. Christians who aren't ready to tell them that Jesus, to tell folks that Jesus saved me and that's why I am like I am today, that I'm no longer the Curtis that I used to be. I'm, I'm now in Christ. I've been born again. I've been saved. I'm not looking to the things I used to look at. I'm not after the things I used to be after. I've been changed. I've been born again. I, I, as truthfully speaking, I was literally crucified, meaning I died with Christ. He died for me, but I died with him. And so now I live a new life under a new king, headed in a new direction. I'm not perfect, but I'm headed in a perfect direction. I'm not perfect, but I'm following a perfect king. And I'm being changed every day. Today I'm not going to arrive unless I see Jesus. And then I will have arrived. But if I'm still on this earth when I go to bed tonight, it means I'm going to bed still not perfect yet in my condition, in my position I'm perfect in Christ, hallelujah, but in my condition, I'm not. So we see this, to, to have our feet shod, he's talking about now, notice this, he's explaining how we take unto ourselves this whole armor of God. It's not getting up in the morning and imagining with your eyes closed that you're putting on the gospel shoes of peace. Yeah, I've got my gospel shoes. That's in the church. Now, I want you to know that preachers are teaching that garbage, that witchcraft, and that's just not how God operates. God operates in your life 
exclusively through your faith in what Jesus did at Calvary. If that's where you keep your faith and you believe in your heart that he died for your sins and that now because your faith is in him, you died with him and you've been resurrected and made a new person in him, now you're going to find the power of the Holy Spirit to live for God. And you're going to be not imagining these things happening in your life. They're just going to be happening. You're just going to be wearing the whole armor of God through your faith in the cross. So, but, it has, but you have to take it to yourself. It has to be a personal. This is really talking about a personal relationship with Jesus in a biblical way. Our personal relationship with Jesus is not sitting around imagining some Jewish man with dark eyes and dark long hair wearing a robe and I'm just sitting in his lap with my head. Listen, man, that's witchcraft too. I'm sorry, that's witchcraft. My relationship with Jesus Christ is based on what I do with the cross. Amen, Brother Curtis. I'm my best deacon. I'll amen myself this morning while everybody else is still sleeping. Glory to God. Listen, my relationship with Jesus is based on what I do with the cross. His sacrifice. If my faith is there, I'm in a personal relationship with Him and the fruit of His Spirit is going to be evident in my life. If my faith is not in the cross, then I'm not going to be in a personal, I might be related to Him as a, as a, a brother and I might be a son of the living God now, but I'm not going to be in fellowship with the Lord if my faith is not in the cross. And there's not going to be any fruit of the Spirit in my life because the Holy Spirit only works in truth. Psalms 33, 4. And if my faith is in the truth, the Holy Spirit has access and the liberty to work in my life and bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of Curtis, the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm talking about a real relationship with Christ. If I'm in it, if, if I'm in fellowship with Him and walking like I should be walking with my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, a readiness in my heart to share this truth that saved me and made me free, that's, that's the result, that's the manifestation of my relationship with Christ. Christians who can't tell of their testimony and, and go around ministering and go around uh, thankful for their salvation, they're not in fellowship with the Lord just because they go to church a couple times a week, my friend. Uh, we've been preaching here out of, out of the book of Luke and about the Pharisee that invited Jesus in, but then Jesus was showing him, even though you've invited me in your house, I'm pointing out to you somebody who knows how to worship me. And we're in that story. And we need to wake up as a church and realize Jesus is either pointing to somebody for us to get a hold of how they're worshiping him or, he, or, or we're the ones he's pointing to. I want to be the one he says, look at him. He knows how to worship. You hadn't worshiped me. He's, you know, that's what that story is about. We're in fellowship with the Lord because we know who he is. We know what he came to do for us. And that's not a, a, a thought that was in the past that saved me when I was 11 years old. That's a right now thought, thank you Jesus that you came to die for me. I'll thank you every day. The cross won't get old. I'm not going to let it become some old message from the past and I'm also not going to be just let it become a message that I preach. It's a message that I take to heart today. Right now I take it to heart. If I don't then I can preach it but I can't live it and I don't want to be found in that boat. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't say, all right, we've gone far enough. Get me down from here. I've proved that I, I let you put me up here, but we've gone far enough. I'm only going this far. That's how some of us get, if not all of us at some point, we get like that. But it's time to move on. If, we, if we're preaching this message, let's believe this message. Let's forgive and move on. Hallelujah. Let's be like Jesus. Glory to God. And so we got to be ready. And it's talking about our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel means good news. And peace, Colossians 1.20 tells us that he made our peace by the blood of his cross. You need to memorize that. You need to highlight that. You need to never forget that. You don't get the peace of God because you ask for it. I'm going to say that again. You don't get the peace of God. God, I need peace today, and I just pray that you'd give it to me. Boom, I, I, I just got it. I felt it, God. No, I used to be in that witchcraft, and that ain't God, and it don't work that way. Let me tell you something. Jesus, the Bible says, made your peace, in Colossians 1.20, by the blood of his cross. You put your faith in what Jesus did for you at Calvary. You don't even have to ask your heavenly Father for peace. The Holy Spirit just ministers it to you because 
because your faith is in the avenue that he gives it to you. Amen. Some people, oh, I just don't know about all that. You ain't got to ask God. Listen, I got sons at home, and the Bible plainly teaches my heavenly father is better than I could ever be as a father to my sons. And he's told me that, uh, let me just say it this way, when my boys come in, they don't have to ask me before they go to the refrigerator. They just go in and get what they want to eat, and they eat. Amen. They don't have to say, Old Father Curtis, may I have a bologna sandwich. If there's bologna in the refrigerator, they go get it. If there's ham, if there's leftovers, if there's whatever, they just go make it if they want to. That's the same with our Heavenly Father. God has already provided what you need through Christ. And if your faith is in what He did to provide you these things, the Holy Spirit just ministers to you these things. You, if you don't agree with this, then you must think you have to work for it. Mm. You must think you have to work for it. Jesus has already worked for everything I'll ever need. Amen. So he made my peace by the blood of his cross. And so if we're standing, the Bible tells us having done all to stand, stand therefore, and if we're standing, we'll be able to withstand, and while we're standing, the fruit of peace will be manifest by the power of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of peace. In the world of chaos, we'll have peace. And when the, ch when the church goes mad, we'll have peace. When we're going through a hard time and everybody just is going crazy, uh, even on our behalf, we'll be having the peace of God. We have peace not only with God, but the peace of God in our hearts. God made peace with us when he sent his son. And when we placed our faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary, we were no longer under the wrath and the separation from God, but we are now under the grace of God where there is peace and mercy, there is freedom and liberty, and I'm thankful today. So our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means if we're taking unto ourselves the whole armor of God, we've got the loin belt of truth on, we've got our breastplate of righteousness on, and we are ready to tell about this armor we're wearing. We're ready to tell about the, the, the protection we have in Christ, this hedge that we're in, uh, covered by the blood of Jesus. We're ready to tell somebody that not only what Jesus has done for me, but he's willing to do it for you, praise God. And, and verse 16 says, above all, everybody say above all, above all taking the shield of faith. Why, why does the Bible say above all taking the shield of faith? Because everything that comes to the child of God is going to have to come by faith. And if you want to turn over and look at Romans 10, 17, just so your eyes can hit it, and we won't just be quoting it since it is a Bible study. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That means faith is not true faith unless it's faith that comes from hearing the Word of God. And the Word of God is always going to be in the context of Christ and Him crucified. I don't care where you're at from Genesis to Revelation. God is trying to reveal his son to us. And the proof of that is in many places in the Bible. In, in Hebrews 1 and 1 where it says in times past, it diverse in various ways God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he speaks to us by his son. So what we've got to hear God saying is by his son. And that's talking about through what he did at Calvary. If you want me to prove that in scripture, I will. Hebrews 12 and 24. We'll turn over there and look at that since we're not in a hurry to get out of Ephesians. Uh, we've been in it over a year and we, we'll be out in a few weeks. So hang with us. If you're in a hurry to get out, that means you're not getting what you're supposed to be getting. You're focused on getting out of Ephesians instead of getting what God wants you to get while you're still in it. Amen. Ephesians 12, 24 says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that means purification, that speaks. Did you hear that? It's the blood of Christ that's speaking, my friend. That's why when the word of God is preached, it's got to be in the context of the blood. Even under the old covenant, when Moses would read the law, they sprinkled it with blood. 
For the Word of God to have any effect in your life, it's got to have been heard through faith in the blood. It's the blood. That's how God speaks to us in the last days, by His Son, by what His Son did at Calvary. Well, you see it right there. That speaks better things than that of Abel. Listen, God told Cain, your brother's blood cries out to me. But he's telling us here, the, the blood of Christ is speaking better things than that of Abel. It's the blood of Jesus. Does the Bible not say in Ephesians 2.13 that it's the blood that has drawn us near to God? Yes, it does. And let me tell you something. We were drawn near to God, not by just Jesus bleeding on the cross, but by the message that comes from that. That is God's declaration of righteousness. Can we look again? Uh, the Lord, well, the Lord's given it to me this morning, and in in I believe it's Romans chapter 3. It don't hurt to roll through the Bible. Amen. Romans, I love the Word of God. I love the truth. Uh Watch this in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. The Bible says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness. The cross is the message from heaven. The cross is how God speaks to all of humanity. We're showing it in the scriptures today. If a minister stands in a pulpit and he's not sharing the Word of God in truth, which means through the cross, in the context of Christ and what he did at Calvary, it ain't going to work. Listen, all these messages about how to be an elder and how to be a deacon, listen, it may be good and biblical, but if it's not related to Christ in the cross, even that, how to be an elder, how to be a deacon, it ain't helping nobody because God ain't speaking through, oh, yes, he is, I've got his word. But if it's not in the context of the living word, the truth, Jesus Christ, and what it is that made him our applicable truth, it won't help anybody become an elder or a deacon, they'll just be in that role in a legalistic manner. Somebody said amen. So we see it right here in, uh, that, that we've shown that. So, And what we're talking about is above all, taking the shield of faith, this shield that, that, that the Bible here, wherewith you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Don't you wish you'd known this when you were five years old? And you Do you know how much hell we would have missed out on? Do you know how much sin would have been not even in our lives? Do you know how much ruin would never have come to us? How much torment our bodies would have never had to go through had we known this and believed this and been raised up in this? But here's the good news. You can forget all the what ifs. Thank God you're hearing it today. Thank God you're in it today. And what we threw away for years, the devil won't gain one more inch of ground in our lives because we're learning what it means to believe God and trust God and to wear the whole armor of God just to trust in that finished work. It is the place God spoke from heaven. Hallelujah. The places in the New Testament you hear God speaking vocally, thundering His voice from heaven that we find in the New Testament always was when Jesus was involved in something that was pointing to His death on the cross. John baptizing Him in the Jordan, bringing Him up out of the water. The voice from heaven spoke, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with, uh, who was it, Peter and, uh, and John and, and, and James? Is that right? They were up, he was up on the mountain with him, and, and uh, uh, who was it, uh, Elijah and Moses showed up, and the Bible says to talk, I'm asking these Bible scholars, uh, to, the Bible says to talk about his decease, and Peter's excited about it, he's like, oh, this is awesome, this is it, this is where I'm saying, you ever had something so wonderful you thought you'd just camp out there? That's what Peter was saying, just camping out right here, I've never seen it, Jesus is glorified right here on the mountain, we, hey, should we build booths right here and just live here, stay here, this is where it's all started, and the Bible says, while he thus spoke, the voice from heaven said, this is my son, hear him, shh, hear him. 
But every time you see that voice thundering from heaven, it's when the focus was on Jesus and what he would do at the cross. And so we've pointed out in, in Romans chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 1, and Hebrews 12 and 24 about the way God speaks. He don't just speak out through a tree or a cloud. God speaks through the cross. He speaks through the cross. We've shown it in Scripture. Any other way is not of God. We won't hear it. It's not God talking to you. If God's got something to say, the Bible points it out in Scripture. He's going to say it by His Son. That means through what His Son did at the cross. I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter if He's sending you to Germany. It's, it, he's sending you to Germany to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen? So watch this. Above all, you've got to take the shield of faith because if you don't have it, you won't be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. All the fiery darts of the wicked one, of the devil, is lies. That's what he throws to you. You need a drink. You need a smoke. You need a pill. You need this. You need that. Those are lies. All I need is Jesus, praise God. All I need is him. You need to tell a lie to get you out of this mess. You need to do this. No, I need Jesus. Hallelujah. That's all I need. Above all, I need the shield of faith that comes by hearing the word of God, the truth that I have strapped to my loin belt that's causing me to walk in truth, walk in a readiness to share this what I have. Amen. It's good stuff. You ought to be here this morning. Because it's always better live here. Amen. Amen. Above all speaks of the most important. Without faith, this is impossible. Without faith, everything's impossible. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. That means he's not pleased if there's not faith involved. And that's not just faith in anything. That means faith in Jesus and what he did for you at Calvary. Any faith in any other thing. And i got to clarify this morning because most of Christianity, and when I say most, I mean 99.9999999. We could just go till the sun goes down on that. They don't understand that the only object you've been given from God to put your faith in is His Son and what His Son did at Calvary. Your faith can be for lots of things for God to do, but your faith can only be in what Jesus did for you at Calvary. And when your faith is, you, your faith can't be in healing. I mean, your faith can't be in heat. Your faith can be for God to heal you, but for that to happen, your faith must be in Christ in Christ and what he did at Calvary for the healing to be manifest. So never forget that. When you move your faith from Christ and what he did at Calvary to anything else, it, God's not pleased because that's not faith. Faith is only manifest as true faith if it's in the Word of God and Jesus is the Word of God made flesh to dwell among us to be, so that we might behold his glory, John 1 and 14. There can be no faith without believing the Word of God in the proper context, which will always be in the context of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, confirmed here, right here in these scriptures, by speaking of the armor of God, which is representative of Christ and His atoning work on the cross. Did you get that? Did you understand what I just said? Our faith, this armor of God is pointing to Christ and what he accomplished on the cross. And taking the shield of faith, you got to, faith only comes by hearing the word. And we've got our loin belt uh, uh, girded up, the Bible's already told us, with truth. That means Jesus, when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. Only his death has made us free. Not just knowing there was a man that died. Somebody recently on Facebook was talking about, well, uh, just you know, you just got to believe Jesus existed, about like history, Hitler existed. Man, believing Jesus existed won't do you any good. You have to believe he came to die for your sins. And there's a lot of people that think they're going to heaven by believing Jesus. Well, I believe in Jesus. No, they believe he existed. They believe there's a God. Believing there's a God won't get you to heaven. You have to believe in the one, the only God sent, His Son, Jesus Christ, to atone, make payment for your sins, my sins. Only as Redeemer, our faith in Jesus as Redeemer, repenting from our sins, accepting Him as Savior, and, and, and uh, uh, 
the propitiator for our sin, will get us to heaven and to give us the power to live this life. Amen. So when we see taking the shield of faith, that means we're standing in the truth that our loins are girt about. We're walking with these, uh, with our feet shod, uh, bound with the readiness to share this message. These are people who are wearing the whole armor of God. People who aren't are still in social cliques in these gatherings. They're in these denominational rules and regulations and hierarchies. And listen, I, let, let me tell you something this morning. People who are wearing the whole armor of God are talking about Jesus. They're not talking about their ministerial junk. It's okay to mention it, but they're talking about the gospel. They're wearing the gospel shoes. of pe They're ready at any moment to drop that sword uh, into every conversation. Man, we're ready to talk about the Lord. We're ready to talk about the gospel because that's what we're walking in. That's what our shield of faith is, is there for, not to just quench fiery darts, but to show that we are the ones in the earth today paving the way for this word of God to go forth so that the lost can be saved and the children of God can learn to live saved. Amen. So when we talk about anything to do with faith, we're talking about the only thing that pleases God is faith. And he's given faith to us as a shield. When he gave us uh, Jesus, he gave us the whole armor because it's only faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary that crushed the devil's head. It, let me say that again. It's Christ. If you're trying to defeat the devil... Listen, that's, trying, that's like trying to drink a glass uh, that ain't got any water in it anymore. The devil is already defeated. He exists. He goes about, Peter wrote, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and God will allow him to devour you unless you learn how to resist him steadfastly in the faith. That means with the shield of faith. That means according to the Word of God. That means according to what the living Word of God did for you at Calvary. You confessing Scripture will not defeat the devil. You taking unto you the whole armor of God, that means believing with your heart under righteousness, letting the Holy Spirit lead you in this path of righteousness now. And that the cross is the only thing that defeats the devil. It defeated him 2,000 years ago. Even though Peter and the boys and all the people stood there... Even the centurion that said, Behold, surely this is the Son of God. He still really didn't understand what happened at Calvary, even though he had a revelation of who Jesus was. He, I mean, Peter, who'd walked on water and, and followed Christ and been such a powerful testimony uh, of his faith in Christ. Even when Jesus died, Peter said, Well, we might as well go on back to fishing. Mm, something, isn't it? Ah. <sighs> But Jesus rose, him, raised himself from the dead and came back to get them. And uh, I lost my train of thought there. We'll roll back into it here in a minute. My brain ain't that big, you know. <laughs> there can be no faith without faith in the cross. There can be not, no faith without faith in the cross. You say, well, I've got faith in God's Word. And that means your faith to be accurate is faith in God's Word. And what he did for you at Calvary. That's the only way the written word is going to work for you. If the written word will work for anybody outside faith in the cross, then that means anybody can just open the Bible, even the lost, and start quoting the word, and it'll work. And that's not true because the word of God is God, John 1 and 1. And the word, word of God is God, and God only works in truth. You got the word, but are you seeing the word in truth? Do you have your faith in the truth of God's word that will make you free? Praise God. So we've got the shield of faith. Faith, and let me get back to this. I'm, it's trying to come back to me now. Jesus defeated the devil 2,000 years ago, and even though Peter and the boys didn't really understand what happened, make no mistake about it, the devil knew when Jesus gave up the whole, when he gave up his last breath, what had happened to him. At that moment, Colossians 2, 14 through 16 tell us that Jesus made an open show of all principalities and powers overcoming them, triumphing over them in his cross. The devil did not have a three-day party till Jesus raised himself from the dead. Listen, that did not happen. That is not in your Bibles. The devil knew he was stripped of all his power when an innocent, without spot or blemish man died for the sins of humanity. He lost his power 
power over death that he had. That's in your Bible in Hebrews 2 and 14, that through the death of Jesus, Jesus stripped the devil of the power of death that he had. That's in your Bible. The other stuff that's being taught is not in your Bible. So when we place our faith in what Jesus did at Calvary, the devil is reminded of how defeated he is, and the Bible teaches that he will have to flee from you when you resist him steadfast in the faith. That's what the Bible teaches, and I'm hanging on to God's Word. Oh, the devil's going to throw fiery darts. He might flee today, but tomorrow is going to come, and he's coming back because the devil is not a quitter. Oh, he quit serving God. Yeah, he got kicked out of heaven. But what he's doing now, he's been doing it for I don't know how long. And he ain't going to quit till he's thrown away and put away forever. He is a liar and he's going to keep lying. That's what the fiery darts are. He's going to keep throwing them. He's going to keep telling you, you ain't got to forgive. Your faith is right, but you don't have to forgive. He's going to keep telling you facts, trying to get you to live by facts. Well, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. That's a fact, but it's not the truth. Listen, the truth is don't forsake the assembling of yourselves, hallelujah, but be more faithful to the house of God as the, as the day approaches. Oh, you don't have to give money uh, to go to heaven. That's a fact, but we don't live by facts. We live by faith. It comes by hearing the word of God. And the word to bring all the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse. Oh, you can get on Google, man, and just live however you want to, but you'll hear one day I don't, God telling you, I don't know who you are because Jesus taught it's only those who do the will of the Father who are going to inherit heaven. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I'm one of those inheritors today. So, I want us to see this this morning. Above all, taking the shield of faith. This is so important that we get this. The shield of faith is not something you just picture you as a soldier and you're holding up. The devil's telling a lie. Bless God, I ain't believing. I... You, you, you're some got the you've got the the shield on your wall in your office and the sword and and you've got in your mind that you're some big armored soldier. No, Jesus is my good soldier. Hallelujah! He's already won the battle. It's his battle, and he won it. Hallelujah! And and the reason the reason the Bible tells us above all. Get this today. Above all, taking the shield of faith. This is above all it, because when we take the shield of faith, it proves that our faith from our heart is in the Word of God. Because there is no shield of faith without the loin belt of truth. There is a progression here. That's why he started out with the loin belt of truth. If your faith and your walk is in truth, then your feet will be sharing this gospel of good news, this gospel of peace. And listen, you, the, the, the breast, your heart will be covered with his righteousness, praise God. The breastplate of righteousness. Mm. And... And you'll be walking in this truth. And as you're walking in this truth, you're going to have this above all, you're going to have the, bre the, 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 the shield of faith because, listen, your faith comes by hearing God's Word. And God says here in the Bible that He's exalted His Word above His name. Above all, you've got to have faith in Christ to quench the fiery darts of the devil. This is a scripture that confirms what we preach. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. The shield of faith is according to the word of God, the word of faith, which is the faith of the Son of God that loved us and gave himself for us, forgave our sins, atoned for our sins, and defeated the devil that held us captivity in our sins. Praise God. There's always a joinery, if you will, a connection to Christ and the cross, and it must must be taught, it must be preached, it must be believed, or we will be without the armor. And if we're not wearing the armor as pastors, then the people of God are stripped naked before God as well. Do you understand what I'm saying today? This is kindergarten, this is elementary, this is not hard to understand. The way of the sinner is hard, hallelujah. 
Amen. God's commands, God's word is not, it's not grievous to us, the Bible says. It's not hard. It's, it's easy. I hate for those that say it's hard. There are some things that's harder to understand, such as all the eschatology, but our focus is not eschatology. Jesus is coming, praise God. Those things are interesting, and those things are true, but what you need right now is, yeah, come on, Jesus, come get us right now. But if he didn't come right now, and he didn't because I'm still talking, then what you need need is to learn how to live for God until he comes for you. The focus is not eschatology. The focus is how do I live for God? How do I lay up treasure in heaven for myself? How do I uh, bring forth the fruit of the Spirit of God? How do I please my heavenly Father? That's not pleased without faith. My utmost desire in my life from sun up to sundown, even in my dreams at night, should be to please my heavenly Father, and he's only pleased by faith. That's why he says, above all, you've got to take the shield of faith. It's not just because it protects you. It's because when you're holding the shield of faith and the enemy's being reminded of how defeated he is and that he can't do anything to you that God won't let him do, that God's being glorified while you've got that shield of faith. While he's being reminded of how defeated he is, God's being glorified because above all in your heart, you've taken the shield of faith that represents his son, Christ Jesus, and what he did for you at Calvary. Calvary. Glory to God. I'm going to get happy this morning talking about Jesus. He is my shield of faith. He is my loin belt of truth. He is my shoes of peace. He is what I wear every day. Not imaginative in my mind, but a reality through my faith in his death. Glory to God. Without faith, one cannot take unto themselves the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God speaks of the provision of Calvary. Therefore, one's faith must be in Calvary. And this is above all, as the faith is our shield. You can't do anything to shield the devil from killing you and your marriage and your children. You can't do anything except take unto you the whole armor of God, which means your faith remains in the cross. That's your part. I want you to know that this, that's your part. I, people have left our church thinking they could help their God-hating husbands or wives uh, just by them stepping down. Listen, they're helping to kill them. They're helping to kill Whenever in God's Word there's something there that tells us we should be walking in, loving, forgiving, planted in the house of the Lord, even more so to that perfect day. All these things that we're told to do in the, in the New Covenant, and Jesus, by the way, taught, if you don't do my Father's will, you won't go. You can call me Lord, Lord, all you want, but it's those who do the will of the Father who are going to make it to heaven. And if you step down from something, anything God's called you to do, think you thinking, you raising your thinking above God's thinking, which is in his word, that means you're no longer taking the shield of faith. Above all, you've got your own shield now. It's a shield you've come up with that you think now based on because no longer are your faith in God's word because you pulled out from what his word's telling you to do thinking that, well, I'm going to try this my way. So you've got another shield. That shield will not only not quench every fiery dart of the devil, it will absorb it like a sponge and you will be full of the enemy's wheel, hell snare at his, at his lies and you can't get out of it until you repent and take back unto yourself again through faith in the cross, the whole armor of God. You're not going to help anybody by pulling out of God's will for your life. That's your thoughts. You won't find that in the, in the word of God. Oh, but I'm trying to save my marriage. Then do it by wearing the whole armor of God. Because your marriage is under attack. The devil's throwing fiery darts. It may be at you. I'm sure it is. It may be at your spouse. You may know how to, how to take unto yourself the whole armor of God. They may not. But listen, I hate that. I, I, I hate that. But you've got to keep wearing it. I don't care if they will or won't. You've got to. Jesus said, if you let them get between me and you, you can't be my disciple. That means you're done learning. That means you've taken the armor off. I'm just telling you what the Bible teaches. I know a lot of people don't want to hear it because it causes them to have to, what we talked about after church Wednesday night, Brother Jeff and I talked a little bit about repentance. And, and, and listen, repentance is never comfortable. 
Conviction and repentance. It's never comfortable. You know, God don't just wake you up uh, on Friday morning and, 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 and put it in your mind that uh, you need to repent from that. And you say, okay, praise God, I'll just repent. No, 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 you won't. Conviction comes. Heartbreak. I can't believe that, you know, I, I, I've been in this for 40 years. I've been in this for 10 years. I, you know, I've been doing this. And now the Holy Spirit's convicted me. Yes, he's convicting you because it's not bringing glory to God. And you and listen, and now you have to repent. And repent means you've got to ask for forgiveness. It means you've got to accept what God did in Christ to forgive you. And you've got to let the Holy Spirit work now to get that thing out of you, off of you, get you through. Amen. So, this faith, this shield will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked if it is faith in the cross as faith is that faith that destroyed the enemy. I remember I used to lay on the ground with my face buried up in the carpet on Monday nights in another church I was in for years. And I, 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 I'm being honest, when I'd get up, there would be spots on the carpet from me crying. Crying tears over the loss, crying tears over the dark cloud of religion in our region. But I, I got to admit to you this morning, I was a part of the problem. Tears meant nothing. They only meant something to me. They didn't mean anything to God because I wasn't preaching the truth. I was preaching things that we'd got in the Word and, and, and it was the Word of God in, in, in what we wanted, the Word of God in, in our denominational thoughts, the Word of God in, in what we felt. And, and all these things, all these fads that come about every single year, the new books and the how-tos and the why we should and all these things, beautiful covers and catchy titles, but they're, they're they're not pointing you to the cross. It's just man. And we can cry with people and our tears and our hearts are so sincere. I mean, we are broke, but we do not understand that we're a part of what's broke. And God's not going to just honor. Revival never came to that house. God had to get me out of that church to get me back to a place where I could be revived to Him. They're still, those people still aren't preaching the cross. They still don't know what me, we mean by preaching the cross. They're preaching still, 16 years later, they're still preaching a bunch of false doctrine. And they cannot, hear me this morning, they cannot wear the whole armor of God because their faith is not in the cross alone. We're rolling quick this morning. Ephesians 6, 17. I hope, you, I hope you really got something out of that. Rightly dividing the word lets us know the shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing the word, and the word's always in the context of the living word and what he did at Calvary. And, and we see that. I don't want us to leave this too quick. We see that because the armor of God is pointing to Calvary. If you don't believe that, you're a part of the apostate church. Amen. You can't preach. Listen, I saw somebody's post a few, uh, week, uh, few nights ago about uh, posting about they preaching about the blood. Listen, you're, if you're a preacher, you're called to preach about the blood every week. Look too quiet in here this morning. That should have been a glory. Hallelujah. Thank you. Because it's the blood. It's through the blood God's speaking. And if you're not preaching the cross, he ain't speaking through you. Oh, that hurt. That's right, it's called conviction, and it's time to repent. Or just go with your thoughts and see where they take you. I don't like my thoughts. I don't even like my thoughts when I'm reading the Word of God. I accept God's Word as what God thinks, and I'll just hang on to that in the context that God wrote the Word, His Son, Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh, Jesus. Outside of that context of who the Word really is, it won't do us any good. Oh, we can build big buildings and we can fill them up with people. But God's not pleased with that. He's pleased when the revelation is coming into the hearts of those who believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what He's pleased with. He's not pleased with any. He's not pleased with our building and our nice little studio here. He's pleased with His Son. So if we use this building to magnify the name of His Son, God is pleased. But we can't magnify the name of Jesus without our faith being in the cross. The cross is how the Son magnified His Father in heaven and His Father magnified Him. And I speak of glorifying each other. 
Outside the cross, there is no magnifying the name of Jesus. There is no glorifying our Heavenly Father. The cross is where that all takes place, my friend. Ephesians 6, and listen, if you're watching this and you disagreeing with what I say, be man enough or woman enough to send me an email at Curtis Hutchinson at att.net or just message right on the, 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 the program. Somehow get me a message. But listen, don't just get a hold of me and, and disagree. Show me in the Word where I've missed it. Help me if I've missed it. People who disagree with preachers who are preaching the cross, I don't agree with that one bit. Then you're just disagreeing to disagree, and that proves you're in the flesh. If you're disagreeing because you have Scripture that proves you have a right to disagree, then you're in the Spirit if you love me enough to give me that Scripture. To help me. I'm trying to help you this morning. If I get off track, I expect somebody that loves God that will love me enough to help me. Amen? Amen? Folks who just disagree to disagree, they're in the flesh. Amen. And that means they can't please God in the flesh. Ephesians 6, 17. And, everybody say and. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, can't none of this happen? All we're talking about here is the Word of God. The shield of faith, it come, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. The law and belt of truth, that is the Word of God. Here we're talking about the helmet of salvation that comes by us hearing about Christ in the Word of God and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's all about the Word of God and it's all about the Word of God in its proper context, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Hallelujah. Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation covers the head of the soldier. And with the head, we think. And this is probably all I'm going to be able to share today. i got about ten minutes. So I'm going to talk about this scripture for the last ten minutes. With This helmet of salvation covers the head. If you get man, you got to have a helmet in, in, in combat. you got to have a soldier has a helmet. Uh, and if you don't have the helmet, you're more susceptible to the enemy to, to, to be injured or to be killed easier. If you got to cover this head, if this head gets hit too hard, you're, that's it for you. Amen. And so the helmet of salvation represents the way we think. What we think. And listen, what you think is how you live. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's the way we live. And let me give you this. I've done it throughout the years, and it's just what we always need to remember. It's a very good statement. Don't ever forget it. You and I live the way we live because we think the way we think. And we think the way we think because we believe what we believe. You're living the way you live because you think the way you think. And you think the way you think because you believe what you believe. People who are living in sin, their thinking is all messed up because their faith is not right. If their faith is in the cross, they have the witness of the Holy Spirit that's leading them. And now the Bible says in Proverbs 16.3 that if we commit our works unto the Lord, He will establish our thinking. Mm, think about that. If we commit our works unto the Lord, He will establish our thinking. But notice, that's not talking about if we just start going to church and reading the Bible, that He'll establish my thinking. Jesus, when surrounded by, and I believe it was John 5 and 39, uh, or 29, somewhere right in there, he, He's surrounded by a bunch of people that said, Hey, what must we do to do the works of God? And He said, Just believe upon the one whom He sent. See, our works are just to believe in Christ and what He did at Calvary. That's our works. Well, I thought we were supposed to be going out and witnessing to the lost and feeding the hungry and, you know, and being in the house of God and prayer and study. Listen, those things can't happen in recognition of our God rightfully unless our faith is in Christ. If our faith is not in the cross, then it's not in Christ. And if our faith is not in Christ, then the works we're involved in are not of Christ. Because He only works in truth. Psalms 33, 4. Highlight that. Don't forget it. Don't say, well, that must mean something else. It does not mean anything else. When the Bible says, for those who have ears to hear, more will be given, it means those who just take the Word of God at face value. 
And they don't need a preacher to come along and change it to fit what they think. Those who have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, know this, the Spirit of God wrote what the Spirit of God is saying. And if you'll just believe it, then your life will become blessed. Praise God. So, the helmet of salvation represents our head. It covers our head the way we think. And the way we think is the way we live. But the way we think is based on what we believe. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5 say this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Where do we get the knowledge of God? The Word of God. Where do we get the knowledge of God? Through the Word of God. Nobody knows anything about God except through the Word He's given us about Himself. So watch this now. Casting down imaginations that we all have and every high thing that we all have that exalts themselves against the knowledge of God, the Word of God, in the context of Christ and Him crucified, and this proves it, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Not your obedience. The obedience of Christ. When our thoughts are going hayward, listen, we're talking about the helmet of salvation that covers the head, the way we think. When our thoughts begin to run wayward, can I get a witness in here this morning? Your thoughts will run wayward. You can be right in the middle of prayer and all of a sudden find yourself right in the middle of lust. I'm being honest this morning. You can be crying out to God from the sincerity of your heart and wake up in the middle of your prayer thinking about something you ain't supposed to be thinking about. Anybody that says, not me, brother, you're a liar. (laughs) You're just lying to God and yourself. You can be in a move of God. You can be crying to God in prayer and all of us in the twinkling of an eye, your mind have thoughts about something you shouldn't even be thinking about. Something sinful. But the Bible tells us here we can grab a hold of those thoughts and take them captive to the cross to where Christ obediently died in our place. Hallelujah. Where we could be delivered from those thoughts that not only pop up there and try to carry us away, but we can grab them and carry them to the cross. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Y'all going to make me happy in here this morning. Instead of our thoughts carrying us captive, we can capture them and say, you know yet." don't I was crucified with those lusts we're crucified with Christ his obedience unto death on the cross hallelujah glory to God we're talking about the way we think until you walk in that place you won't know you got to come back to Calvary and when your thoughts go wayward in in, in sinful ways not only that but when you get weak and, and and you start feeling like you just can't go on and this is this might be the end um, I don't I just need to quit watch this there's another scripture I want to read to you this morning. The answer is the cross. Hebrews 12, 3 and 4. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself so that you won't be wearied and faint in your minds. Faint in your mind. Here's where we think in our minds. We think with our minds. The helmet of salvation. If we've got that, we've got the whole armor unto ourselves. One piece of that is the helmet of salvation. And my thinking is no longer stinking. My thinking is along the lines of faith. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My, my thinking now is according. Watch this. Man, we got to get there. We got is it, is it Romans? We're, we don't have very long this morning, about three minutes. Watch this. I want to bring this out as we close here. Romans, isn't it? Romans 12 that talks about. Look at this. Here it is. Romans 12, 3. I got about three minutes. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's not talking about everybody in the world. That's talking about every every believer. 
God has dealt to every believer the measure of faith. When we came to Christ, we placed our faith in what Christ did at Calvary. God gave us a measure, that measure of faith. And he's telling us here, that's what we're to think according to, that measure of faith that comes to us by God through what we believed in the Word of God. Remember, even the measure of faith, faith only comes, that measure of faith only comes as we place our faith in Christ according to the Word of God, what He did for us at Calvary. And the Bible here says we're to think soberly. That means according to what Christ did for us at Calvary, we're to bring every thought captive to His obedience unto the cross, uh, unto death on the cross. And if we're not bringing our thoughts captive unto His obedience, and if our faith is not, if our thinking is not according to that measure of faith, then we are thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to. And we don't understand the whole armor of God. And if we don't understand it, we can't wear it. You have to under No, I ain't talking about to the, the, the just fullness of the revelation, but you've got to understand Christ died for your sins, not so you could just get to heaven, but so you could be armed and dangerous to the enemy. Armed, protected, armed and, and benefiting from the cross, armed and dangerous. To the enemy's kingdom. And if listen, if, you're, if your thinking is not according to that measure of faith, that means according to the Word of God, then you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. And that can happen. And that's where we find ourselves contributing, helping the enemy. Giving others the occasion to sin and to blaspheme God. Because that's what we're doing when we're living defeated lives. Instead of wearing the whole armor of God and being a witness unto God and a testimony unto what Christ did for me at Calvary, I'm living in sin, I'm living in defeat, and others cannot be blessed through me. Amen. Well, we got a little bit farther today than, than we normally do. So uh, the answer for everything is the cross. Folks who don't like that are under law. They, they're under law. Everything is about the cross. I remember being in the Philippines and a guy preacher asked me, what you going to preach, brother? I said, the cross. He said, how about your next message, the cross? He said, you mean you're going to preach the cross every message? I said, till I die, I'm going to preach the cross. Amen. And so tune in next week right here. Listen, do me a favor. Hit the share button. The like button's just saying you liked it. The share button means you're involved in sharing this gospel, the word of God that's going out. Help us publish it and support the ministry. We're asking for your help, sharing the message, sharing your finances to help us do what we do. We just bought a $1,300 camera to put out here. So praise God for the opportunity. We love you. We'll see you right here next week.